Okay, welcome back to the, should I call it the graveyard shift? It's usually the difficult shift, you know, um, after you've had something to eat, it's been a long day, you know, it's even worse in Johannesburg, in Johannesburg, Pretoria, where it's very hot today as well, you know, so it's quite a, yeah, hence I refer to it as a graveyard shift. But anyway, so we're going to have a look at this tutorial question that we're looking at. Um, I'm sharing my screen on now. So this is a a a a very. Um, what I'm going to focus on, it's really about us having a discussion about the things that are contained in the tutorial, and um, working through those and and you know how how you need to to think about about these things and the approach to the an approach to the question. That's what we're going to that's what we're going to focus on. And then of course we look at the required, discuss the required and see what are the points that are relevant to that required and so forth. Yeah. So I'm not going to be looking at the solution. This is one thing I'm going to make very clear. I'm not going to be looking at the solution. You will get the solution. If there are any questions that you've got in the solution, you know you can always drop me a message um, on WhatsApp and then I can then respond to 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 that qu specific question on the on the solution. But I want to use this opportunity for us to have a discussion on this tutorial and you know things like approach and so forth. OK, so welcome to Avery and we hope you do. You will do well in your role as text trainee in the company. Then Avery is a small property development and management boutique that is involved in the commercial, retail, residential, and industrial properties. Avery was founded by Kutleho Mokoteli in 2015, who is a South African resident and, and is a South African resident company for tax purposes, and it is not a small business corporation. Uh, actually, I think I've opened the wrong one. Let me see. I need to get this because I want to make notes. And I think it's easier with word to make notes. Right. So important things. It's not a small business corporation. So that's something that is relevant that we need to be uh, on the lookout for. So because it's not an SBC, you know, then it's going to be subject to to tax at a, a flat rate of um, 27%. And we're not going to apply the sliding scale, which is applicable to SBCs. Okay, so whenever you're looking at a question and it's a company question, you must always be on the lookout for um, is the company an SPC or not? And the reason why you want to be on the lookout of whether the company is an SPC or not, it's because remember in your questions, your questions always say that you need to minimize the tax that is payable by the taxpayer. So the tax that is payable by a small business corporation is generally lower than the fixed rate of 27%. And therefore, that's why you want to go and look and say, fine, is this company not a small business corporation? Something that you must constantly be on the lookout for. Um, so we're dealing with a SA resident company, meaning that it's subject to tax in South Africa on its worldwide income. And we look at the type of business that they're involved in. So it's a property development and management boutique and they do commercial residential um, retail as well as industrial properties okay that might be something that might become relevant at a later stage in terms of the type of business they are involved in but for now it's something that we just note that that's the business they're in and uh, the more information we get we'll then have to make a determination of the relevance of this information so the financial the financial year and years and year of assessment of the company ends on 28 Feb each year, and then I, Avery is registered as a Category B VAT vendor, um, and then all amounts exclude VAT unless otherwise indicated or where otherwise defined in terms of the VAT Act. Then we've included two transactions that would like you to assist us with. All right. So we're saying this is a Category B VAT vendor. So for you, what does that mean? So if we say a, a vet vendor is a category B vet vendor, what does it mean? So what does it mean if you're a category two vet vendor? Ah, not category two. 
Category B, vet vendor. Guys, the uh, tutorial is where you do the mo most of the talking and not me. But category B, it means that it's actually the tax period is actually in either February, April, June, August, or December, the last days of the calendar of okay, those three and, months. Okay, and, those, how, how, those months. and how long are those um, vet periods? Two months. Okay, so it's a two month vet period. Yes. And again, it's the vet. So category B is the vet period ending Feb, April, June, August, October, December. Yes. Okay, so that's category B. Whereas category A would be the two month vet period ending in Jan, March, May, July, September, November. Yes. Okay, so that would be category A. Category A and category B are both two month vet, vet periods. However, it's just that they end um, on different on different um, months. Okay. Generally, what you find is that a vet period will be linked to the to the financial year end. So here you are seeing that um, the year end is Feb, and that's why then the the a category B vet vendor linking then the end of their vet period to the financial year. Okay, so two month vet period. That's just something that we're highlighting and making a note for ourselves so that at a later stage, if we need to give um, or if we are, when we, we are giving more information, we then see how is that relevant to the rest of the information that is provided to us. Okay, and it does say that all amounts are exclusive of vet unless stated otherwise or were otherwise defined in terms of the VAT Act. So for me, that should tell you that possibly there might be a term that is provided to us in this scenario that is defined in the legislation as an amount that is inclusive of VAT. Now, we just need to know those terms. As soon as we come across them in the, in the, in the question, we need to know um, that this amount is an amount that is inclusive of VAT or an amount that is exclusive of VAT. So as an example, if in this question you are given open market value, what does that mean? So if in the scenario they want to talk about open market value, what does it mean? It includes that. Okay, so it's an amount that is inclusive of that because remember from the definition that we read earlier on of open market value, it said it's an amount that is inclusive of that. Okay, let's then look at transaction one. So developed and managed property. So on 13 May 2020, Avery purchased a piece of land in River Glen Township, Johannesburg, from a South African resident who is a non-vendor for tax purposes at a market value of 7.4 million. The company paid a deposit of 1.5 million to the seller on the same day. The balance of the purchase price was paid to the seller on 31 August 2020, the date of registration of the property in the name of Avery. Transfer duty of 206,000 rands was paid on the date of registration. Yeah. <clears throat> let's, um, okay, let's, let's continue reading. It then says the company pay, purchased the piece of land with the intention of developing a building, a building consisting of six identical shops on the ground floor and 20 identical two bedroom flats on the first and second floor. The shops represent 25% of the total square meters of the building, and the flats represent a, the other 75%. The South Kent Revenue Service accepts, accepted this ratio for VAT apportionment purposes. Okay. Maybe let's, let's stop there. Let's just look at those first two paragraphs. In those first two paragraphs, so you've got a, a piece of land that was acquired for 7.4 million. There was 1.5 that was deposited. And then the rest of the balance was paid on the 31st of August 2020. So now my question back to you guys is in the hands of Avery, this is now back in 2020, in the hands of Avery, what were the VET implications when this property was acquired? Um, I think um, Avery 
or what, however we pronounce it. Um, we have to look at first, um, he's not a vet vendor, um, meaning that um, he's probably not making taxable supplies. And then when he acquired the land, maybe not, or maybe he was levied um, output tax on the, on the land. However, he couldn't claim um, input tax on that. No, but remember, Avery is the company. So Avery purchased a piece of land. Okay, I think I am talking about the River Glen. Is it River Glen? Yes, no. remember Avery purchased a piece of land in River Glen Township for 7.4 million. That land was purchased from a non vendor. Oh, okay. I'm messing things up. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, anybody else wants to share their thoughts? Um, first of all, is okay, Avery is the company. So what I've realized that Avery is a vent vendor. Okay. So now it will take me to go to my section eight part whereby it talks about how I should go to vet vendor and how I should actually apply it. So I do not know off by heart, which I'm sorry about. <laughs> so I don't want to read it. And then after that, I will also consider the time of Avery, the time of the what do we call vet? What do we call the full sentence? Time of supply. Because I see if they put registration and the time that he paid his consideration. So I must look at earlier off one of the two. Earlier off which one of the, which two? Um, Earlier of the consideration and the, the date of registration. Okay, but you've got the facts there in front of you. Apply that to the facts. Oh, okay, let me open it. All right. Yeah, that's my difficult that's what I'm struggling with. Should I start where I started where I looked at section eight? Yeah, start where you want. Yeah. Okay, I went to sec I went to um section eight. Is it sub? I don't know to see if it's sub 13. Let's so double check. No, sub is sub 16 number B. Where they say the supply of any, and so I say, I say the supply by. I think I'm confusing things. The supply by which any vendor, to me, the vendor is Avery. But Please Avery has not made any supply. Avery has acquired a piece of land. So if it has quiet, okay, now this way I mixed it up. Yeah, yeah. that one, I, okay. now, I, now I'm lost. <laughs> okay, let me, let me try again. Okay, go um, for it. On the, on the 13th of May, 2020, every purchased a piece of land from a non-vendor. So therefore, um, he was not levied output tax, but then there will be deemed, um input tax to be claimed by him or notional input tax, right? And then the value of the land will be the market value of 7,475,000. And then the time of supply will be the early of the two, either um, registration date or the time where um, pay me, payment was made. Okay. And I think, I think we will apply um, section 16, subsection 3. Okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. Sorry, continue. Once you're okay. done, say I'm done. So I'm okay. just going to continue listening. Okay, so I'm going to be applying um, section 16, subsection 3. Um, that's uh, we, we found the time of supply, which is the area of the two. The value of the supply will be the market value. And then it says that the company paid a deposit of 1.5 million to the seller on the same day. Um, I did not really get, because I was not sure, I did not really get um, what type of, um, are they used, are they on invoice basis or on payment basis? But um, since he paid the 1.5 million on, on the same day, I think that's the day where he will be able to claim the input tax or the notional input tax 
the on the 1.5 million but it will be on the full amount and not on the deposit i think so i think i'm done okay out of out of seven marks how many marks do you think you'll give yourself Okay, I'll speak about time of supply. I'll give myself one mark. And recognizing that it's a notional input tax. Uh, okay, I'll give myself plenty marks if I explained how I got to notional input tax. So I would so say- So why did you not explain? Yeah. Let's say if I'm writing, I think I'm gonna explain it. I think it's my pet. Mm -mm. But you see, it 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 doesn't happen. It doesn't happen by miracle when you're writing. It must happen even when you're talking about it. Eh? So we must get into the habit of talking as if talking as if you are writing. You know why I say that? It's because it it gives you an opportunity to practice. Okay, so don't think when I'm writing I'm going to write this way, but when I'm talking I'm talking another way. Okay, so whenever you're talking text. Talk as if you are writing so that you get into the habit of talking full sentences, talking comprehensive responses where even application is done. Because I'll tell you why I say that. So having listened to you, you are touching, the, you are touching on this, you're touching on that, you're touching on that, but there's no, you're not applying, there's no application. Yeah, you're touching here. I'm gonna do this uh, earlier of payment or registration, and that's why you left it. Now you didn't bring it together and say, okay, fine. There's payment because now you then say no, but then there's a deposit of 1.5. Mm, but then registration to happen on the 31st of August. Um, but again, you don't bring it together. Okay, value. I'll give you a mark there because then you're using the market value. And over and above everything else that you've done, you did not come to a conclusion before you said, yes, now I'm done. Because remember what I asked, my question to you was, and not just to you, but to the rest of the class was, what are the VET implications as a result of the purchase of that land by Avery? So ultimately what we're looking for is for you to answer that question and say the VET implications are the following. Okay, now that you've discussed all of these other things, as a conclusion, the VET implications are that Ivory can claim input of X amount to the extent of taxable supplies, for example. Okay, does that help? Yeah, it definitely does. Okay, so yeah, it's to ensure that we bring everything, everything together, do the application. Um, and the other thing is, of course, when we're having these discussions, the other opportunity I then get is that an opportunity for me to be able to coach you. Because the the other than just me lecturing and lecturing, there's also the element of I need to interact with you so that I can coach you. And I think that's where the, the most value add then comes in with things like tutorials. Because I'm able to coach and 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 point to where you've got shortcomings. And in that way, you're then able to take that and apply it, for example. When it comes to when it comes to tests. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah, so it said the company um, had purchased the piece of land and with the intention of developing a, a building consisting of six identical shops on the ground floor and 20 identical bed, two bedroom flats on the first and second floor. It then says in terms of their split. The, it, that split is a 25% for of the building is for the shops and 75% of the building is for um, the flats. So what does it mean? Why would they include that paragraph in this in this um, in this scenario? So that we will know to what extent are we making taxable supplies? Okay. So what what extent are we making taxable supplies and why? Are you saying it's to that extent that we make making textile supplies? Um, I would read that again. So it's saying that um, the intention was developing a building consists of six identical shops on the ground floor, 
and flats first and second. So if it's going to be shops on the ground floor, then it's used for commercial purposes. Therefore, it's not exempt as it's not residential accommodation. And then above there, it says two bedrooms and first, second floor, which means that's residential accommodation portion. So the shops represent 25% of the total square meter, whilst the flats represent 75%. So if the flats are going to be representing 75%, it will mean that that's an exam supply. And if the shops are representing 25%, then it's probably for making taxable supplies. Or, yes, taxable supplies. Uh-huh. Happy with that. Happy with that. See, I like that we are talking, we are talking full sentences and we are explaining everything in detail. Right, so the 75% represents a residential accommodation, and we all know for that purposes, residential accommodation is a, is a non-taxable supply, whereas the 25%, which is the shops, represents a commercial building, and a commercial building is then, of course, then subject to tax at the standard rate. Okay, so you do to the extent of, they will claim input to the extent of their taxable supply. So there will be notional input that they'll be entitled to because it is um, notional input um, on the purchase of second and goods from a non-vet vendor. Okay. And it then says, now the generally what tends to confuse a lot of people is that they take the, the um, what do you call this? The principles around second and goods and they confuse them with the principles for um, purchasing of a property. So remember when it comes to the property it says that um, that is triggered at the area of payment or registration. Now the deposit was paid on the 13th of May 2020 which means then the transaction was then triggered because it's the area of payment or registration. Now registration only happened on the 31st of August. Okay, so then um, Avery would then be able to claim the input on that 1.5 million deposit. Okay, so they'll be able to claim because now the transaction has been triggered for that purposes because it's the area of payment or registration and payment happened on the 15th, on the 13th of May 2020. Okay, so that has triggered payment and therefore transaction so therefore VAT has taken has taken place. Okay, so you account for VAT or you can claim input on the on the entire amount. But remember when it comes to when it comes to um the the um, what do you call it? Claiming of notional input. When you're claiming notional input, you can only claim notional input to the extent of what you have paid. Okay, so even though the market value of the of the property is 7.4 million. The fact that they've only paid 1.5 million, then they can only claim input to the extent of what they've paid, which is the 1.5 million. Okay. So it's just an additional element. Area of payment or registration, that's for the purposes of um, the timing of the sale of, of the timing of the acquisition of that of that um, property, but over and above that, you then look at the second and goods and say, okay, fine. Second and goods says to the extent of the payment that has been made. Okay, happiness. Any questions before we move on? Okay, let's continue then. If there's anything, we will, yeah, we'll look at that. So the building consisting of shops and flats was completed on 15 Feb 2021. And then the total construction cost amounted to 28.2 million. This includes 7,000, 7.2 million that was paid to casual laborers. And then Avery commenced with the letting of the shops and the flats on 1 March 2021 in terms of 24 month agreements. Then Avery had been struggling to keep the building at 100% occupancy level because of the COVID-19 pandemic effects that, ha that has had a significant impact in the property industry. 
each flat is let at an amount of 18,500 rands per month, and then rent is payable in advance on the first of each month, then ever received the following rental income and incurred the following costs during 28 Feb 2020, 2024, sorry, um, year of assessment. So they've got rental income for the shops is 1.3 million, whereas rental income from the flats is 3.5 million. Then you've got repairs and maintenance of 213. You've got rates and taxes of 74,400. Then the Board of Avery is considering the sale of the River Clan property because of the struggles with the occupancy rates and asked management to go on the lookout for a buyer. Then management has indicated a buyer, which is Shailesh Gavender, who is willing to buy the property at a consideration of 45 million. And then Shailesh is a wealthy resident of the United Kingdom who represents who frequently undertakes business opportunities in South Africa, but does not spend enough days in South Africa to meet the physical presence test. And then Shailesh's brother, who is Tony Gavender, owns 22% of the equity shares in Avery. Then Shailesh owns 66% and the remaining 72% is owned by Trutlejo. Okay, so Shailesh is willing to buy the property at a consideration equal to its market value of 45 million. However, management of Avery decided to entice Shailesh with a, with a discount of 2.5%. Um, an independent third buyer would not be eligible to this discount and Shailesh plans to acquire the property with the intention to earn the rental income and for capital appreciation over the over a period for which he generates the required return on investment. Thereafter, he will sell the property. Okay, right. So there's quite a lot that is happening here in terms of now this property is being sold to um, a shareholder number one. Okay, so the property is being sold to a shareholder because Shailesh is a shareholder that owns uh, 6%. Okay, so Shailesh is a shareholder that owns 6% in the business. Right, so question then would become, what would be the tax implications if I go to the required? So the required says calculate with reference to the legislation the income tax for Ivory that will arise from the sale of property um, to Shailesh. So the income tax for, for Avery. Okay, so how would you calculate the income tax for Avery, guys? So how would we calculate the income tax for Avery? Somebody, anybody? Okay, come on, guys. The required said we need to calculate the income tax that will arise from the sale of the property to Shailesh Governor. Okay, it's very specific. So what would happen if this property was sold to Shailesh? Won't I first consider if they are both connected persons? I don't know, ma'am. You must <laughs> tell me. My, I'm asking you. a question. Now you ask me I think a question. First I'll co okay, do you want me to answer or must I put yes, the triggers like as if I'm answer. answering it in the exam technique way? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Can you take yeah. it down to the scenario? Can I please? Take it down to the scenario. Take it down to the scenario? Yeah, the, the specific part that we're discussing. 
This Sorry. is the specific part we discussed. Oh, to Shailesh. Sorry. Okay, anybody? Let's go for it. So what would be the text implications? So the required says, calculate with reference to the legislation, the income tax for Avery that will arise from the sale of the property to Shailesh Kavinda. Okay, I'll give you guidance. Okay, so it's a sale of property. So it's a capital asset that is being sold. Okay. What would be, so let's put it, what would be the base cost of this asset? So what would be the base cost of the asset? So what would um, be the base cost of the asset? Won't it be the how much they got the bond for this the input tax that they would claim? Won't it be? Sorry, say that again. The the cost of the asset less the input tax that they claimed. Yeah, what's the cost of the asset? Um, for the base cost, I think it's going to be the market value. Um, I think including the transfer duty because it's also um part of the base cost definition, paragraph 20 of the exchange rule. Okay, I need numbers. Let's translate what you're saying into numbers. So you're saying to me, because you, you're saying to me, okay, it could be this, it could be that. Give me the numbers so that we can then say, okay, that's the base cost. So the 7,475,000 plus the 206,250 transfer duty. Okay. That's it. I didn't calculate the input tax, so I'm not sure how much it is. Okay. Now, and I'm asking that's that that would be your base cost. No, I don't minus, think so. Minus the allowances that they would have gotten on the building. I think okay, also include there is um total construction cost. Okay, yeah. Yes. Um so the total construction cost is twenty eight million two hundred thousand, but then this relates to I think everything. Um everything with regards to um the building shops and flats. So we would have to find a portion that um is going to what we're selling. Is it? Oh. Yeah, that's fine. So it will be the 28.2 plus the 7.4 plus the transfer duty of 206 okay do you think avery would qualify for any allowances on this building
I think you would have um, capital allowances for for the portion that was not used for 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 carrying on a trade for I mean making taxable supplies. If I understand you correctly, you're saying there'll be capital allowances for the portion that was not used to make capital to make capital allowances. Please say it again. Sorry, because I'm. Um... Okay, I'm trying to think about what I just said now. So while she's thinking, does anybody else wants to share their thoughts? Would they not qualify for Section 18.6? Which says what? That the, you must have a minimum of five residential properties. You must. Like you should have them for the purpose of carrying on the trade and. You must, so you've gone silent. Sorry, I've tried to read. So it says that that they should be within the Republic. You must have mm -hmm. at least five residential units. Mm -hmm. uh, they should be new and unused, which they were because they developed them. And then... That they're going to be used solely for the purposes of trade, which they were using them for because they were renting them out and they were yeah they were renting them out which is a trade okay okay so you're saying we need to calculate section 13 uh 13 section 6 on the residential the residential properties the res yeah. residential portion what about the commercial portion would you qualify for um an allowance there there are lots of us here guys um, and i keep hearing the same voices eh there are lots of us let's all jump in I think yes. you will. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yes, there will be a, an allowance on commercial buildings in terms of Section 13. Quite. And then the allowance, based on my calculation, will be for commercial, uh, it's going to be 300, uh, 352,500. That's the commercial allowance that I got. So you said you said seven twenty five percent. Multiply that by the cost of the building. Yes, multiply by the five percent, which is the annual allowance. Yes, multiply that by the five percent. Yes. Okay. Happy with that, and then of course, a uh, section six set would apply to um, to residential. Again, it's also at five percent, a rate of five percent, which means. On this asset would have qualified for capital allowances that we would have claimed. And therefore, what we need to do, of course, is that when we're disposing of this building, because it's an allowance asset, we first need to calculate what is the recoupment. Okay, so we first need to calculate what is the recoupment and say what's the in us determining the recoupment. Remember recoupment equates to selling price limited to cost minus um, the um, minus the tax value. Tax value. Okay, so minus the tax value. So that's what you do. Selling price limited to cost minus tax value. And then um, calculate your, your recoupment. And then you then come back and say, okay, fine, what's my base cost minus that minus 
whatever allowances we've previously claimed. And then for your proceeds to then be your 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 selling price minus um, the recoupment that we've included in taxable income. Now, question from my side, guys. The the proceeds it said to us they are going to sell it to him at market value. However, they wanted to give him a sweetener, and therefore they've given him a two and a half percent discount. Is this relevant? for CGT purposes. So in the determination of our proceeds, would that 12% discount be a relevant amount? Um, yes. Why do you say that? Because he's a connected person, so. Is it a connected person? Please, please convince me how you got to that conclusion. Um, he, he he owns shares of six percent, and then his brother owns twenty two percent. So he's connected through his brother. What does the connected person's definition say? I think if you're a shareholder, you are connected to the company. No. If you own. What does connected person's definition say? What does the definition say in section one of the Income Tax Act? Then you must read the portion where it says in relation to a company. Once you get it, please do read out loud. Okay, for person, it's going to be Roman figure four, which says any person other than a company as defined in section one of the Companies Act, that alone or together with any connected person in relation to that person holds directly or indirectly at least 20% of, uh, of, of the equity shares in the company or the voting rights in the company. That's not where it ends. It continues. Okay, and then Roman figure five, it says any other company, if at least 20% of the equity shares of voting rights in the company are held by that other company and no holder of shares holds the majority voting rights in the company. Okay. So if we look at that, so you are going for the 20%. So are you then saying to me, we've got um, Tony Gavender that owns 22%. And Tony Gavender and Avery are connected persons. And you are then saying to me, because Tony Gavender owns more than 20%, um, then that means Tony Gavender is a connected person to the company. And because Tony Gavender is a connected person to the company, therefore, that means Shailesh is also a connected person to the company. Uh, yes, that's that was my reasoning. OK, that was your reasoning. However, I think I am not of the same view because I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. But I will tell you why. So I'm just looking at for the connected person's definition. Um, any other company if at least 20% of the head shares out of which are held by that other company and no other. OK, so that would be the thinking um, behind um, behind that that connected persons. But I think what's important Again, it's, it's to prove. You see, in your mind, you said these are connected persons, but you did not prove that they are connected persons. You simply said, oh, no, but Tony Gavenda is a connected person to this other one, connected persons. No, you need to prove these things, that this one owns so much 
and therefore they are connected person to the company and because this one owns so much and they are related to this other one, they are brothers, therefore they are connected persons, therefore come to that conclusion. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so you've got connected persons and because we've got connected persons then, what does paragraph 38 of the 8th schedule then say? So paragraph 38 says, were you disposing to a connected person? And, and if for a consideration which does not reflect an arm's length price. And if you if you remember when you read that it, this, the scenario, it said, however, management uh, management of ever decided to enhance and entice, not enhance, entice Shailesh with a discount of two and a half percent. Then it then says an independent third buyer would not be eligible to this discount. OK, so can you see this discount is specifically applicable to Shailesh, even if a third party came and they wanted to pay the same amount of money that Shailesh wanted to pay, they would still not get that transaction, which means the transaction is not at arm's length. And because the transaction is not at arm's length, then paragraph 38 then says, uh, the person who disposed of that asset must be treated as having disposed of that asset for an amount received or, or accrued equal to the market value of that asset as at the date of that disposal. And then the person who acquired that asset must be treated as having acquired that asset at a, at a cost equal to that market value, which cost must be treated as an amount of expenditure actually incurred for the purposes of paragraph 20, so paragraph 1A. Okay, so what we're simply saying here is that this building and land that has been disposed of, even though Shailesh has been offered a 2.5% discount, for the purposes of CGT, Avery is going to have a inclusion of proceeds of the market value, which is the 45 million, and they will not consider the discount that was provided to Shailesh. Okay. All right, so then we'll calculate the CGT according to that proceeds will be equal to market value, which means even when you are doing the when we are doing the the recoupment, you know, our selling price will then be the market value and not um, the selling price of 45 minus the two and a half percent discount. Okay, but limited to cost, of course, and our cost is the 28 million, 28.2 plus the plus the the cost of acquiring the land, which was the 75, not 75, sorry, 7.4 million, which was the cost of the land. Okay, so that would be the principle behind it. So the sale of that property to Shailesh, it might look like it's straightforward, but it's not because the proceeds, you need to consider that there's connected persons and therefore things must have be at market value. When it comes to the cost, you need to consider the cost of the land as well as the cost of the of the building, which is the 28.2. So then on the building, you will then qualify for the allowances. So being section 13.6, section 13 quad on the different portions of the building. So yeah, any questions before we move on? Um, yes. Yes, ma'am. When you are calculating the allowances, the cost, the tax value for assets, do you deduct the input tax that they would have claimed? Yes, you would deduct input tax. But remember in this question, the question said all amounts given to us exclude VAT. Okay. So then there's no need for us to, to, to deduct input because the amounts given to us in this scenario exclude VAT. But like... If they don't, and you have to calculate, for example, recoupment, and you wanting to get that tax value, you would do it without VAT. That's correct. You would do it without VAT. Thank you. Because the question has already said the amounts are exclusive of VAT, and therefore 
um, the award is given to you is already after taking that into consideration. OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, right. So let me just see if there's any other thing on transaction number one. OK, so it then says to us we need to discuss four key tax factors that Chinese governor should consider prior to acquiring the property from Avery P2I LTD that will arise from the acquisition, holding and the sale of the property. So for eight marks, we need to discuss four key tax factors that could impact this thing. So acquisition by, by Shailesh, the holding by Shailesh, as well as the sale of the property. So what are some of the things that you think of when you're talking to Shailesh? And you're saying, Shailesh, as your tax advisor, these are the things that I think you need to consider before you acquire this property. So what would those things be? I think what comes from the top of my head is Silesh, Silesh is a non-resident and then um, he's acquiring or she's acquiring um, a, an immovable property um, regardless of whether he, since no, since he's not, uh, regardless of whether he's not a resident, he's still going to be um, levied, not levied, charged, uh, it's going to be taxed because it's an immovable property that is within the Republic. OK. And how will it be taxed? Um, if the property, I'm thinking that if he's holding the property for whatever, using it as a source, it will be taxed on whatever that he will be producing from that immovable property. OK, so you're saying um, you're saying to me, uh, Shailesh, when he acquires the property, one thing you must consider is that um, um, he will, he will of course generate rental income and he'll be subject to to tax on that rental income because the source of that income is the republic. And it's an immovable property, yes. It's an okay. immovable property in the republic. Okay. So the other thing that's given to us, but I know that I didn't well much on this is article six of the TTA between South Africa and the United Kingdom. Because remember, Shailesh is a resident of the United Kingdom, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So what does the double tax agreement say? Because that's also something else that we need to consider. So you're saying Shailesh yeah. should be taxed in South Africa, but he's taxed in South Africa after having considered what the double tax agreement says. So Article 6, subparagraph 1 says, income derived by a resident of a contracting state from immovable property, including income from agricultural forestry, situated in that other contracting state may be taxed in that other state. Then capital gains derived by a resident of a contracting state from the alienation of immovable property referred to in Article 6, 1 and situated in that other contracting state may be taxed in that other state. OK, so let's determine who is the contracting state, who is the other state. OK, so if I read Article 6, 6, 1, it says that income derived by a resident of a contracting state. So income derived by a resident of the United Kingdom, because Shailesh is a resident of the United Kingdom. So you, that's how you must then read the double tax agreement. So income derived by a resident of the United Kingdom from immovable property situated in South Africa, because other contracting state is now South Africa, situated in South Africa, may be taxed in South Africa. OK, so what this means is that you see the, the DTA uses the words may be taxed. OK, so whenever it uses the words may be taxed, it's giving options between South Africa. So not that it's giving options, it's giving taxing rights to both South Africa and the United Kingdom. So it's saying that South Africa, because the, the property is situated within, well, the rental income is coming from a property situated within your country, you have the right to tax that amount. And similarly, 
because um, the taxpayer is a resident of the United Kingdom. So it then says, um, so you won't be subject to, sorry, not that you won't be subject, but the United Kingdom also has the right to tax that amount. So it will then be both South Africa and the United Kingdom that will then tax that amount if it is disposed of. So he might be subject to double taxation. And because it's subject to double taxation, then he must think of what relief can he get from the United Kingdom legislation that would ensure that he does not get double taxation. OK, so that's another factor that you need to consider. So having said that the amount to be taxed in South Africa, you need to consider that um, that income will be subject to the double tax agreement and the double tax agreement gives both countries the taxing rights. OK, so, but then that does not um, do away with what I discussed, right? I will start by defining um, or saying that he is a non-resident in terms of the section one gross income, he will be taxed on the source within the Republic. And then I will speak about the double taxation after I've said that. Um, yes, of course, you'd have to, yes, you'd first need to, to talk about the fact that he's a non-resident. And if he's a non-resident, then he's subject to, first, we need to consider the implications of the double taxation agreement. And then because the double taxation agreement then says, both countries may tax the amount, then you then go on further to then start talking about, okay, according to the South African legislation, because the source of that of that rental income that is generating is South Africa, he will then be, so it is saying the source is South Africa because of section nine, um, subsection two, and therefore he'll be subject to tax in South Africa. Okay, so you will still score some marks. I think there are some marks that you would have missed out on, but you'll still score some marks. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. And then what else would you guys discuss? What else would you discuss? So if a non-resident, because remember the question said it's about the acquisition. So if you look at the required, it said that will arise from the acquisition. So we've already discussed from the acquisition that um, so if he acquires the building, he will own it as a capital asset. Um, and of course, when he dispose of it, he will um, be subject to capital gains tax. Um, from the acquisition, maybe the other thing I wanted to ask is, he received a discount of 2.5% when he acquired this property. What's the relationship between Shailesh and Avery? What's the nature of the relationship between Shailesh and Avery? Is it that they are connected persons? Yeah, and why, why are they connected persons? There's something important there about why they are connected persons. What gave rise to them being connected person? On the shareholding from his brother. Uh, but remember, he also has his own shareholding. At the 6%. Which is a 6%. Okay, so if you transact with a shareholder and the shareholder receives a benefit from that transaction what should be the the red light that should be flashing in your head would it be that section 31 might apply section 31 31 transfer pricing yes mm. Okay, poss possibly, possibly we can look, look at section 31 because then you then say there's a transaction between connected persons and it no, it's not at arm's length. So the key thing about section 31, of course, is to then say, is there a tax benefit that has been derived as a result of that discount? Uh, 
And I think for me, that's where the difficulty will come in, in that what is the tax benefit that has been derived from this transaction? Dividend. So we say that again. So what would be the tax benefit that has been derived? So I'm just thinking section 31. OK, so potentially I would say yes, you would discuss, you would discuss um, section 31. OK, because we've got connected persons that have entered into a transaction and it was not at arm's length because of the two and a half percent. And therefore, um, because it is at a discount, then there will then be tax implications because if you look at 31, it says any term or condition of that transaction operation scheme or agreement or understanding is a term or condition contemplated in paragraph B of the definition of affected, of affected transaction and results or will result in any tax in any tax benefit being derived by a person that is a party to the transaction. So as long as one of the two parties has derived a tax benefit. Now, if you then look what is a tax benefit, a tax benefit is when you uh, either postpone or reduce your tax liability and by giving a discount of two and a half percent Avery will end up with a lower pros will end up with lower proceeds and because they end up with lower proceeds there is then a tax benefit that is derived okay however because remember what we did because we've applied the anti-avoidance provision that's available in the paragraph 38 of the eight schedule. Actually, there's no tax benefit that has arisen. Because remember in paragraph 38, we said, no, 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 they are connected persons. They are selling at a discount. Therefore, the proceeds will then be the market value. So it, it won't apply here. So this won't apply because we've already applied another anti avoidance section and we've brought up their, 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 tax, their proceeds and therefore, they have not received a tax benefit because as a result of us applying another tax provision and another anti avoidance provision. Okay. Okay. What about dividends tax? What about dividends tax? Would you consider dividends tax? Okay, what about dividends tax? Would you say the potentially could be dividends tax on this transaction? So if you read definition of dividend in section one, it says it means any amount other than a dividend cons consisting of a distribution of an asset in specie declared and paid as contemplated in section 31 subsection three. Um, transferred or applied by a company that is a resident for the benefit or on behalf of any person in respect of any share in that company, whether the amount is transferred or applied by way of a distribution made by or as consideration for the acquisition of any share in, in that company, but does not include any amount so transferred or applied to the extent that the amount so, so transferred or applied constitutes a return of CTC whatever, and all of that. But the key thing for me, it says that it means any amount transferred or applied by a company that is a resident for the benefit or on behalf of any person in respect of any share in that company. So now we then look at this and say, OK, fine. Um, Shailesh, you have received a, a discount of two and a half percent. And it then said an, an independent third buyer would not be eligible to the discount, which means the only reason Shailesh is entitled to this discount, it's because of the relationship that Shailesh has got with the company. And that relationship that Shailesh has got with the company is a relationship of a shareholder and a company that has issued the shares. And therefore, in my eyes, 
Shailesh should also consider that there will be dividend tax implications as a result of the dividend that is would be deemed to have been declared to him because of that 2.5% discount. Okay, so that's another consideration that you need to think of. Dividends, there is a dividend. There would potentially be a deemed dividend as a result of the discount that was given to him. Because the only reason he got that discount is because he is a shareholder. Okay. And then the last thing is when Shailesh disposes of this, if Shailesh were to dispose of this property, what would be the implications? So if Shailesh were to dispose of this property, what does he need to consider? Um, I think the amount of the base cost will be what he acquired the asset for. So he okay. can subtract from the proceeds the full amount, but a 97.5 of the base cost. Yes, because the, the base cost is the expenditure actually incurred. So the fact that um, Avery ended up paying tax on the on the at market value when they disposed of the asset, for Shailesh, it will only be at um, the 40, 45 million minus the 2.5%, because that's a discount that he got. Okay, um, what else, what else, what else would you need to consider? Would it be the the withholdings tax? What withholdings tax? Yeah, you're on the right track. What withholding tax? The property withholding the, the immovable property withholdings tax. If you're a non-resident, if you sell immovable property. I like hearing section numbers, eh? Section 35 cap A. Uh huh. Section 35 cap A says that where a non-resident disposes of a fixed property within the republic. That sale is subject to a withholding tax. Okay, so the other thing that Shailesh must consider is that when he sells the property, he'll be subject to withholding tax um, in terms of Section 35 cap A, and therefore he must not think that he will get the full amount paid as cash into his bank account. A portion of it will go to the tax authorities as part of a withholding tax. Okay, this is such a nice question, guys. You see, when we talk tax planning, it's these types of questions where we're talking tax planning because this one is saying, just advise this taxpayer. What are the things that they need to consider? Okay, so what are the things that they need to consider so that um, when they eventually make the decision, you are then able to avoid certain taxes. Okay, so when they make, when they enter into transactions, you've already considered what the tax implications could be of different options, and then you then choose the option that is best suited for the taxpayer. Okay, so when you're talking tax planning, it's these types of transactions that we're talking about. Okay, and then let's then jump on to transaction number two. So transaction number two, So it then says on 1 April 2023, Avery purchased a piece of land in Isando, Johannesburg from a South African resident, again non-vendor, for a cash consideration of 5.1 million. The property was registered in the name of Avery on 15 May 2023 at the deeds office, and then transfer duty of 242,500 was paid on the date of registration. Um, the company purchased the piece of land with the intention of developing two types of residential units, 10 identical two-bedroom houses and 10 identical three-bedroom houses. The property development was completed on 18 Feb 2024 at a total construction cost of 21.5 million, okay, which 6.1 of that was paid to casual laborers. Okay, so which means the total cost of this, de of this development, it's the 5.1 million plus the 242,500 plus the 21,550. Okay, and then Avery embarked on a marketing campaign to sell these units from 1 March 2023. The marketing campaign has been contracted to Tando Shezi, who was, a, who, who was required to provide the services 
over over four month over a four month period, commencing on one March 2023, in exchange for a two bedroom house. I think this is meant to say on one March 2024. I think this is meant to say 2024, not 2023. Oh no, actually, it could mean 2023. But that was even before we acquired the land, eh? And I think it's meant to say what March 2024. Then in exchange for a two-bedroom house, the house would be registered in the name of Tando and be subject to her occupation after the marketing campaigns are completed. The management of Avery determined the sales proce proceeds using the table below. Okay, so you've got the three bedrooms. Um, their, their selling price per unit was 1.8 million with a cost of 1.4 million. Um, and then the lowest then sell 10 of them making 18.7 million. Then the two bedroom houses, they've got a selling price of 1.6 with an adjusted cost of 1.2. Then of course, we then have um, the house that will be owned by, by Tando as a result of the services that they will, that, um, that he will provide um, in marketing as part of the marketing campaign. Okay, then on 1 March 2023, Tando ceded her right to receive the two bedroom house to a family trust. The value of the right was nil on that date because it is contingent on Tando fulfilling the marketing services. Then market analysis indicates that the market value of the houses is projected to increase by 4% from the from the cost over to the four months over the cost over the four months period. And then Tando is also embarking on a marketing campaign to concurrently list the houses while waiting for the sale of the units. The marketing of the units for sale takes priority over the list over the leasing. Hence the houses are leased over a rolling two month period to ensure that any list houses that, that receives a purchase offer will be ready to be occupied by the buyer immediately after the registration at the deeds office, which usually takes two months. Then we then it then says an illustration, a three bedroom house can be leased for four months from 1 May 2023 at a rate of 17,500 per month and subsequently sold for cash at an open market value of 1.95 million on 30 June 2023. The buyer will pay the 1.950 on 30 June 2023 and the property would be registered in the name of the buyer at the deeds office before the end of August 2023. And then the lease will terminate at the end of August and the buyer will occupy the house from 1 September 2023. Right, quite a complicated scenario where there is a development that has taken place. And if there's any house that has not yet been sold, that house that house gets leased out, okay, until the house is disposed of. Okay, now let's look at what the required then says. The required for eight marks says that we need to discuss the income tax consequences for Tando Shezi arising from the two bedroom house to be received in exchange for marketing services and ceded to the family trust. Okay, so remember Tando received a house in exchange for the marketing services. And then what he did, what she did, sorry, she then ceded the house over to the family trust. Okay, so what would be the income tax consequences there? So what would be the income tax consequences for Tando? As a result of this whole transition, they've, acqu they've acquired a property and they've then ceded the right to that property to a family trust. So what are the implications for Tandoff? Only for eight marks. So um, I'm going to be generic. I'm sorry, I, I can't be specific now because I'm still trying to think. But where they say that Tando said it her right to receive a two bedroom, uh, the part where they say it's contingent to have fulfilling the marketing services. It, I think it tells us that it cannot be a fringe benefit, but it's for services rendered because it depends on her um, rendering a service first. So I would say that um, it cannot be a fringe benefit. 
Okay, when do you get a fringe benefit? What needs to, what's an important thing in order for you to have a fringe benefit? I don't know what you mean there. Like how do you So you're mean? saying you're saying there's no fringe benefit, but I, I just want to get an understanding of when do we ever get a when do we ever have a fringe benefit? Okay, I think um there's a Fringe benefit is a specific inclusion, but then paragraph C as well, if she will be performing services, um, that will be included in her gross income in terms of um, paragraph C, special okay. inclusions, and not, okay. sorry? And not? Not in terms of a fringe benefit, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, so, one, in order for there to be a fringe benefit, there must be an employer-employee relationship. In this instance, Tando is not an employer, an employee of, of Avery. Tando is merely contracted to Avery. So then we can't be thinking fringe benefit. Okay, because there's no employer-employee relationship. Okay, so that's the first thing. And I do agree with you. So Tando has received the house in exchange for services rendered. And because they've received the house in exchange for services rendered, we then have to consider that the amount must be included under paragraph C of the gross income definition. The question that I then have is that did the house accrue to Tando? And the answer to that for me would be no, no because no, there was still a contingency. So the house will only accrue to Tando once the marketing campaign has been concluded. That means that's when Tando has, is unconditionally entitled to that property. So that means that once the marketing campaign has been concluded, Tando will include the value of that house as part of her gross income. Okay, yeah, because remember that house is received in exchange for rendering of services. So it therefore that, how, that the receipt of that house is revenue in nature. So therefore, that value will be included as part of the gross income. So that would be the first thing. And then Tando then needs to then make it clear what the intentions are with this house. With the intention, was the intention to hold the house as a capital asset? Or was the intention to um, hold it as a revenue asset? OK, so for me, the fact that Tando got the house and ceded her right to the house to the trust, for me, it tells me that she initially had intentions of holding the asset as an investment and not necessarily as a trading asset. And because of that, I would then treat the disposal of this house to the trust as a disposal of a capital asset. Okay, so I'll treat that as the disposal of a capital asset by Tando to the trust, and therefore it will then be subject to capital gains tax. So we then need to determine what is the market value of this property when Tando seeks the right to receive um, that house to the, to the trust. Okay, and of course the yes, base sir. cost, yeah, sorry. Us, go for it. No, say that's uh, I was reading the next paragraph, so you can finish and then I'll look at the next paragraph after you. Okay, so I was saying then the market value of that house at that point when the right is seated would be the, the proceeds, and then the base cost, of course, will then be the fact that will then be the amount that was included as as gross income will then be the base cost. So chances are that um between, because you see it says between the 1st of May 2023, they are projecting that the house, the values of the houses will increase by 4% from the cost over the four, 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 four month period. Okay, so chances are uh, the market value was the one, what was it? It was a two bed. So it was the one, 1. 1.6 million. However, it's going to increase by 4% over the four month period, which means by the time 
uh, there are no contingent contingencies over that house, then Tando would have then disposed of that house at an amount of um, 1.6 multiplied by that 4%. Or plus that 4%. OK, so you can ask your question. They're saying, yeah, Tandy is also embarking on a marketing campaign to concurrently use the house as well as waiting for the sale of the unit. I, I don't know what what sale of the unit is it for this as part of the services that she's doing for the company. Yes, so that's part of the services that she's providing to the company. So what this is saying is that, OK, the company has built these houses, okay? So they've built 20 houses. And these 20 houses, they were not able to sell all of them immediately, which means there were some that took time to sell. So what they've then decided to do is that over and above the, the marketing campaign that Tando has undertaken to sell these houses, there was also a marketing campaign that was undertaken to say the houses that are not yet sold we should list them out. And therefore they went out and ran a marketing campaign to try and find tenants. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. But this does not constitute a change in use because from the get go, they were using it for exam supplies, right? Uh, no. So 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 um so in this instance, remember with in this instance, they were not put, they were not providing residential accommodation. So what they were doing is they're developing houses and selling them. Therefore, this this would be subject to VAT. And then, because um, of this, um, sorry, sorry, I'm getting my 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 wires crossed. Okay, yes, they were providing exe an exempt supply. However, and now I must find that that exception. The exception says that where you are a property developer and you are unable to sell your property immediately and you decide to lease it out. That's section 18D, cap D. 18? Cap D. Cap D, yes. Thank you very much for that. So you decide to lease it out. There is a, 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 a grace period where you are not yet deemed to be providing ex an exempt supply. If I remember correctly, that's what it says. It's less than 12 months, I think. Yes, yes. Because what I wanted to ask here is, so they are having these properties that they are they were initially used for, they were just leasing them out. They were making uh, exam supplies. So obviously okay. 18, section 18D or section 18 does not apply, right? And then now they want to sell this um this no, what is happening here no no but sorry so to jump in remember their initial intention was to sell these houses oh okay and then they then said okay fine if we are unable to sell a house what we're going to do we're going to lease it out until we find a buyer then say it constitutes a change in use depending on how long Yes, and hence then I'm saying you then need to consider section 18 cap D okay. because it's it's a temporary leasing arrangement. And that's why the question is very specific that those leasing arrangements are usually two month contracts. Oh, yes. Because okay. it we are trying to clearly indicate that the intention is to list them temporarily until they can find a buyer for them. Oh, yeah. OK, it makes sense. Yeah. OK. All right, so those those are the things that um, Tando will need to consider as part of um, the fact that she she's you know she's she's acquired this property and now she has ceded it to the family trust. Okay, there could be income tax consequences. There will also be CGT consequences. Right then, D then says discuss with reference to the legislation the value added tax consequences for Avery for the 30 June 2023 VET period arising from the illustration of the three bedroom house to be leased and then sold. Okay, so again, it goes back to the point that we we're just talking about now in that, okay, when they were developing these units, um, 
their intention was to sell these units. But of course, there is then this temporary period where they then list them out. And because there's a temporary period when they're listing them out, then the VAT implications then are applied in terms of section 18 cap D during that period when they're listing them out. And then once again, when they then sell that property, then the normal tax implications will then be applicable on sale of that property. Okay. Right, any questions? So does it mean that we're gonna be first speaking about section 18.1 to say that um, it's, they change the use completely from um, holding it as uh, um, what's this, as an as a as a taxable supply to an exempt supply, and then go to apply now section eight in cap D to say that um, it was because of um, I mean section cap section eight in cap D will apply to them due to um, a temporary lease of of the of the thingy of the of the buildings. That's how we do it. We have to go to each one place. That, that, that would be correct. So that would be correct. So you'll first look at, okay, fine. It seems they're changing their intention. However, there is section 18 cap D that then says there is a temporary temporary letting of residential property. And then what are then the tax implications in terms of section 18 cap D? Because you will see that when, when you read section 18 cap D, you know, it says that notwithstanding what section 18 what section 18 subsection 1 says okay but yeah. where goods where goods being supplied consisting of fixed property consisting of any dwelling or such fixed property is developed by a vendor who is a developer wholly for the purpose of making textile supplies or is held or applied for that purpose by that vendor and is subsequently temporarily applied by that vendor in accordance with section 12 12 C, then it then says such fixed property shall be deemed to have been supplied by that vendor by way of a taxable supply for consideration contemplated in section 10, subsection 29. Okay, so it's simply saying that when you are listing it out, even though it's the provision of residential property, you are still subject to that at the standard rate because you are temporarily leasing out that property. Okay, so what will cover the 12 marks is you speaking about section 18.1, then going to value of supply section 10.29, then coming back to section 18.D and also mentioning um, exam supply. So you'd have to first start with the fact that you are dealing with a property developer. So what are the okay. tax implications under normal circumstances for a property developer? Okay. Okay, and once you've spoken about that, only then do you then start going into the fact that, okay, instead of selling this property, they're now leasing the property. And because they're now listing the property, the provisions of section 18 cap D will then be applicable. And then you then, of course, talk about section 10, subsection 29, talking to the value of the leasing. And that um, this, and then under section 18 cap D, because it's a textile supply, and then calculate what is the value, what is the value of that VAT output that they'll have to account for. And of course, whatever expenditure that they've incurred, you know, in order for them to lease out that property, they'll then still be entitled to claim the input because they are providing a taxable supply. Okay. Okay. So that would be your that would be your 12 marks. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I wanted to ask with the the one before um, with the one where she received a house as payment, would that be included in terms of gross income definition or paragraph C? I would include that as paragraph C because she received that house in return for services rendered. Okay. Yeah. So I'll do I'll do paragraph C. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, the solution will be obviously be shared with you guys. 
And once you know you've, you've spent some time going over the solution and being comfortable, if there's anything that you are picking up from the solution, of course, please do get in touch on WhatsApp um, so that I can then specifically address those questions. And um, yeah, do take the time to go through what, what we've discussed today in class, as well as what we, we did when we we're looking at the tutorial question, so that you can become comfortable with this work that is part of phase one. Um, and yeah, and you're available to assist you guys. So whenever, just drop a message, I'll ensure that I, I, I respond back to back to that um, quite quick. All right, so on that note, thank you very much for today's session. I know that I did go over time, but it's just that there are quite a number of things that we needed to, to cover, and I wanted to ensure that we cover as much as possible. And yeah, so thanks for your patience and staying with me um, for a long Sunday. And yeah, I hope I was able to add value to your lives today and let's keep talking. All right, thank you very much. Cheers, everybody.